Lady Victory Church family. It is church time again on Wednesday evening. Uh, we hope and pray that you've had a good week in the Lord. And as we've said before, if not, well, maybe from here on out, you'll have a better ending to your week. Been praying for you, just asking God to do a great work in your life. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll have a few announcements uh, before we get into the message tonight. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We ask for your blessing. We ask that you would speak to hearts today as we get into your word. We ask that you would bless this time. Lord, we don't know who's listening and where they're listening from, maybe what kind of day they've had or week that they've had, but I pray that your holy word would be an encouragement to each one. We love you. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. So as you're getting your Bibles there ready, everyone gathered in uh, there at your home on the biggest screen possible, uh, get everybody situated there, get your Bible, and get everything ready. Uh, that way it's just like church. That way we can just come in. Obviously, it's not just like church, but we'll make it as much like church as we can. Uh, and so everybody just uh, pay close attention there. While you're getting your Bibles ready to Psalm chapter number 46, I'm going to give you just a couple real quick announcements uh, that uh, will be helpful. Uh, one is a, a prayer request here. Miss Shelva Holmes is asking prayer uh, for a friend of theirs that was at their church uh, there in Spartanburg, South Carolina, uh, Miss uh, Phillips. And she is in her late 80s and she has been diagnosed with the coronavirus. And so she is in the hospital. Uh, keep her in your prayers. Also keep Brother Jonathan Oberbeck in your prayers as he is uh, recovering from uh, his surgeries. And then also Brother Wayne is recovering from his surgeries. So I appreciate uh, your prayers for my dad there. He is uh, doing better, uh, but uh, still sore and uh, still has some ways to go. But just keep on, uh, keep on lifting those prayers up and uh, keep on praying one for another and just lifting each other up and keep, keep in contact with people. Uh, let them know that you're praying for them and, and lifting them up as well. Also, this Sunday, I want to uh, let you know that this coming Sunday, uh, we, we have some special things that we're going to be doing. It is our 32nd anniversary here at Victory Baptist Church. Uh, and so for 32 years, God has allowed this place to be here and to be a lighthouse for the gospel of Jesus Christ in this community. And so we celebrate 32 years. The dedication of this church was in February, uh, February 28th of 1988. And so we praise the Lord for those 32 years. And um, we're going to have our picnic. We usually would have a nice meal, and uh, we've had singers scheduled and special speakers, and of course that uh, has fell by the wayside uh, with, with what's been going on, but uh, I still want to have our picnic, and so what we're going to do is we'll have our drive-in service just like we have been doing. We'll do our drive-in service. After the drive-in service, uh, we can then break for the picnic. Now, remember, you have to, <clears throat> excuse me, you have to provide for your picnic. So whatever food you want, uh, you have to bring that. The church will not supply anything. We're not supplying chairs. We're not supplying tables. We're not supplying food, drinks, none of that. Uh, everything is on your responsibility, but after the service, you can have your picnic right there by your car, or you can socially distance out in the field. Uh, go over there under the trees, every family, just find a little spot, uh, keep six feet or so away from everyone. Uh, that way we can say we're doing everything exactly the way that we're supposed to, uh, but you can have your picnic out there and there'll be time to fellowship with each other and just uh, find a chair. It's supposed to be nice uh, this Sunday, so keep that in mind. And then also a special note for our graduates. I believe we have four graduating uh, this year from Victory. And so uh, we want to do something special for them. Uh, we do know that their graduation has been uh, very off uh, in many ways, maybe even obsolete. And so what we'd like to do, Brother Tony's been reaching out to the families of the graduates and the graduates themselves uh, with special notes, get in contact with Brother Tony for more details. But if you could be here Sunday morning at 10 a.m., bring your cap 
cap and gown with you, and then we'll get you set up. We'd like to have uh, a small graduation ceremony and just a, a recognition uh, for you, a time for pictures and things uh, right here at the service. And so uh, if you want to do that, please take part in that. That will be this Sunday uh, in our drive-in service. And then also the cleaning ministry. Uh, we had just a handful of people, maybe three, four people that signed up to help clean. Now I said before, in order for us to come back into this building, we, we have to make some updates. We've got to make some changes to the way that we do service uh, because right now, if you're watching the news, uh, several friends of mine and friends of this church, different pastors, are under a lot of national heat in the news right now because they have opened back up church services uh, before they were, quote, allowed by their state. Now, we understand the Constitution says we can meet, we have the right to assemble. I'm not worried about that part of it. I just want to be able to do it right and safely so that no one says that we're doing anything that's unsafe. So in order to do that, to get back in here, we're making some updates to our building uh, to make things more touch-free, uh, putting in HEPA filters uh, that will filter out viruses in our cooling and heating systems, things of that nature. Uh, and so we do need to then clean in between every service that is here. And so we'll give the full details of what needs to be done, but we need volunteers to do that. So if you want to get back in church, let me know. That means sign up. Uh, you can't have too many people sign up. If I, if I need 10 people and 40 people sign up, well, then we'll put them on a rotation and you might only have to do it once a month. Uh, you know, so we, we just need volunteers. Right now, we're not getting the volunteers. So I guess that means you're happy not coming to church. I don't know. Uh, so just give me some names. Uh, put your name in and we'll put you on the list and let you know what your responsibilities are, okay? I want to get back in here as soon as we can and start you know, some normality, really, back in uh, this stuff. And then uh, also I had some people that had offered, uh, you know, financially. They said, preacher, if the church needs anything, uh, let me know. Well, I'm going to let you know. So we're making several of these updates, uh, which would probably run into the $2,000 uh, to $2,500 range for the updates that are needed uh, here at the church. Uh, so if that is something that you'd like to contribute towards, you just put that right in the, uh, the general fund. Just make a note. Just let me know uh, that that's what you're, you're doing. So you give it with your regular giving and just put it in your general fund and just let me know uh, how much you're giving towards that so we can make a note uh, of that. And then also the last thing I want to talk about is that online giving option. More and more people are using it uh, and it's very convenient. A lot of people pay their bills online. Uh, and things of that nature, uh, we can also use it uh, in this time to give uh, to the Lord. And so if that's something you have questions about, you can call the church office or just go right there to victorychurchhammer.org and sign up right there and uh, they'll take care of you there. So, all right, let's get into the message here uh, this evening. Turn your Bibles to the book of Psalm chapter number 46. Man, God's good. Hey, I thank the Lord for what he's got going. Uh, listen, God's doing something. I thank the Lord for what, uh, what he has been doing. He's been providing. And so it might not be an overabundance, but it's just enough. And God will always have just enough. And I thank the Lord for that. Uh, we've been in the book of Revelation and we've been uh, dealing with end time events and things that are happening in the end times. I'll probably bring another message on that Sunday evening. Uh, but for now, on Wednesday night, I'd like to uh, bring a, a message entitled, The God of Refuge. The God of Refuge. Uh, not only do we thank the Lord that we have a refuge when all of those end time things come, but right now, um, while the storms of life are hitting, I want you to know that we have a refuge. And I want to talk about that refuge here tonight. Psalm chapter number 46, verse number 1, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore will not we fear, though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof, Selah. Father, we thank you for your word. We ask that you'd speak your word to your people tonight. God, I pray you would encourage us. 
In Jesus' name, amen. Now here in this passage of Scripture, he ends, I just uh, read in verse number 3, Selah. Uh, that is a musical refrain. It's a pause. Uh, it means stop and think of that. It means to stop and meditate upon what has just been said. Let it sink in, okay? And so uh, we find here in this place that the Bible says that we have a refuge, uh, that God is the God of refuge. But what is a refuge? Let me just uh, start by uh, defining what refuge is. In Webster's 1828 Dictionary, Mr. Noah Webster uh, defined it as a shelter or protection from danger or from distress. It's a stronghold that protects by its strength or a sanctuary which is secure safety by its sacredness. It is any place, boy, I like this one. A refuge is any place that is inaccessible to the enemy. Inaccessible to the enemy. So a refuge can either be uh, that of a physical stronghold, a physical place, or a spiritual place, somewhere where you can just go and get away from, be sheltered from, whether it's the cares of life mentally, emotionally, spiritually, or whether it is something physical that's coming at you. Uh, I love uh, for myself uh, being in the woods. I, I grew up in the country. I love being in the woods, whether I'm hunting or fishing or hiking or just spending a day outside. I love being in the woods. Uh, you know, just recently I was up in the mountains of north central Pennsylvania and just spending some time up there in the woods fishing and hiking and, and just spending time with God. Uh, it's a time where it's just so quiet. The, the water's there. You can hear the, the sound of the water, the smell of the dirt, the trees, the pines, the, the sound of, of turkeys in the spring or, or, or grouse, you know, uh, that are in there and just uh, deer and, and just all the wildlife that's there. Just a very refreshing time, a time to pray, a time to think and meditate and, of course, catch some nice fish. Uh, but, but all of that, all of that is just being out there with the Creator, being out there uh, touching the very things that He has created. And so what a, what a blessing that that is. It is a refuge uh, for me. It's a place where I can go and just meditate. It's a quiet place. Some preachers go golfing. Uh, I used to do that uh, some. And then uh, Brother Terry and I used to go golfing quite a bit. And then we got into a building project here about 10 years ago, quit golfing, and we ain't picked golfing since. Uh, so I guess we picked up fishing. Now fishing's the, uh, what we can kind of do and, and get out there and find an hour or two here or there or a day here and there and and just enjoy some time in God's creation. But whatever it is that you do, or places you like to go, uh, just to get away. Uh, these are refuge. It's a place of refuge. But not every refuge is a physical place. See, you, you can't always just go to the mountains. You just can't always go fishing. You can't always go to the golf course. You can't always go shopping. You can't always go uh, do this or go here or go there, our favorite vacation spot. So, so there's got to be a place of refuge where you can go even in the middle of all of your trouble. What I'm saying is this refuge that I'm talking about is not just a destination where you would go to and get away from, because sometimes you can't go and get away. It is a place that surrounds us is what I'm saying. Just as God surrounds all of us, this refuge that I'm talking about today that will keep peace and tranquility and calm in your heart and mind is the very presence of God himself. It's there all the time. If somebody, a neighbor's giving you a hard time, it's a place of calm even in the midst of that. Somebody at work, is, is a situation there has turned for the worse. And, and, and even in the midst of that horrible situation that you've got to go to every day, God can build you a refuge, a place where you can go, and a place where you can get away from that, even while you're at work and surrounded by that trouble. That's what I'm talking about today. I'm talking about that refuge. Yes, thank God for the vacation spots or the places where we can go and get away, but the problems are still there. We need, we need God to en encamp around our heart, our mind, our very being, so that wherever we go, we're living in the refuge. You see what I'm saying? We're living in that refuge. We have a refuge. Here in the Bible, the Bible says in verse number one that we have a, a refuge. 
Verse number 3 encourages us that this refuge is a refuge from the storms of life. The Bible mentions here the waters that are roaring, the waters that are troubled, the mountains that are shaking, the ground that is upheaving and breaking and falling apart. And so this refuge is a place away from the storms of life. And then the Bible says in verse number 2, what this refuge produces. It produces a, a peace, a calm. The Bible says, I'm not going to fear that everything fall away. Boy, I, I don't know about you, but this refuge is sounding pretty good to me. How about you? Uh, this refuge is sounding like, man, that, that's a good deal. I, I like that. And so that's what I want to talk to you tonight about is this refuge. What can we learn about this refuge? Uh, where is this refuge found? Who is welcome there? And how do I get there? And so let's, let's answer some of those questions. Number one, I want to talk tonight about the refuge. Let's look at this place of refuge. The first thing I want to talk about is the power of this place of refuge, the power of it. In verse number one, he says uh, that we have a refuge and strength. Do you see that word strength? It, it gives the idea of power, of might, of ability. Listen, the refuge that we're going to be talking about tonight has the ability, has the ability to give you the calm that you need. It has the strength to keep the enemy at bay. It has the strength to protect and guard your mind and your heart from all of the trouble that would come down the road. Uh, capable, capable to help. When all else falls apart, this refuge is powerful. It is capable. In verse number 9, look at verse number 9. It says, He maketh wars to cease and an end of all the earth. He breaketh the bow and cutteth the spear in sunder and burneth the chariot in the fire. So here, watch, the war that comes, the, the person shooting the bow, the person throwing the spear, uh, the, the chariot that's carrying these people, Here's what God says. I'm able to remove the enemy, the transport of the enemy, the weapons of the enemy. I am able to do this for you. That is the strength and the power of this refuge. I don't know about you, but I want that. This power, the power of the refuge. So oftentimes I hear people say, well, preacher, if I can just, if I can just get away from this person, I'll have peace. No, you won't. No, you won't, because the problem, number one, will still be there. Number two, you go somewhere else, and you're just going to have a problem with somebody else somewhere later. You, you can't say, well, if I just get all this done, then this will be better. If I just get out of this debt, then, then if, I just had a, if I just had, you know, $20,000, I can just get out of this, and I'll be over here. No, 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 no. No, probably you'll just get in debt again over here because there's probably something that was mismanaged or bad decisions made over here that got you into trouble in the first place. So, so the idea of just, well, if I just escape, that, that's not what we're talking about here. We are talking about living and dealing with life, dealing with issues, and the power to do that is not in me. It's not in you. It's not in my mind to keep me calm. It's not in my heart to not worry. In my heart, there's a lot of worry, a lot of stress. You know, you're constantly worried about this and that, and constantly dealing with this situation and that situation. I don't have the power to keep it all together. We need strength. And here's what God is saying. I have the ability. I have the power to do that for you, the power of refuge. Now, num number two, let me show you this. We have the refuge. We see the power. Now, I want you to see the person that's involved in this refuge. Verse number one, the Bible says, God is our refuge. You see that? God is the refuge. He is the source of that power. Hope and strength are found in the person of God, in the person of His Son, Jesus Christ, and in the person of the sweet Holy Spirit of God. That's where that's where this strength lies. That's where this refuge is. Look at what verse number 7. Verse number 7 says, The God of Jacob is our refuge. Look at verse number 11. The God of Jacob is our refuge. He's, he's specifically pointing out a specific person. I'm not generically talking about faith today. I'm not generically talking about just love. I'm not generically talking about just a God, a deity, a higher power. That's what the world does, so they don't, have to, they don't have to pinpoint the Lord Jesus Christ. 
But when we talk about the God of the Bible, we're talking about God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We're talking about a triune God when we talk about the God of the Bible. And so people don't want to acknowledge that. They don't want to acknowledge, they just want to say, oh, a higher power, there's a created being that helps me, that helps me when I need help, but then he just leaves me alone and I can do whatever I want any other time. That's not the God of the Bible. That's not the relationship that God is wanting from us. And so what I'm saying to you is the person of this refuge is, is the God of the Bible. It is God. Now watch this. I, I want to show you some specifics here. What the psalmist is doing is saying, look, I'm not, just, I'm not just hoping and trusting in a God or just some generic person. But look at what he says. He says, the God of Jacob is our refuge. What is the significance of this? The God of Jacob. Remember, Jacob, God made a covenant with Jacob. In fact, God changed Jacob's name to Israel. It is, it is a covenant name that would, that would detail and, and spe uh, make specific or specify the children of God, the people of God. So the church of the Old Testament, that is Israel, and now we have the church of the New Testament, that is the church of Jesus Christ. And so he's talking about that, that church, that, that body of believers. And so he says the God of Jacob, the same God who made a covenant with Jacob and kept that covenant is the same God that you and I serve. I'm thankful that I have a covenant-keeping God, a promise-keeping God. When God makes you a promise, you can guarantee it's going to come to pass. That's what God uh, what was getting across to his people. That's what the psalmist here is writing about. He's saying, look, we have a covenant-keeping God. The God of refuge, this person is not just any other person. It is the God who makes promises and keeps them. He uses the word God several times. The word God here in the Hebrew is Elohim. It is the, it is the three in one God, the, the God of creation back in the beginning, Genesis 1. In the beginning, God or Elohim, the triune God. So in the beginning was God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And so what he's saying is he is the creator, he is the giver of life, and he is the sustainer of life. So here's what he says, I have confidence and trust that my God of refuge is the same God who made promises and kept them. And he's also the same God that created everything, gave it life, and then keeps it living. My friend, listen, I'm not worried about a big bang or a big thunderball coming from heaven. I'm not worried about this whole thing burning up and, and some uh, nuclear holocaust coming. Listen, here's what. The Bible says God created everything and God's going to keep it until his appointed time in which then later on at the very end he will destroy it all with fire. And then the Bible says a new heaven, a new earth will come down and, and listen, God will make all things new. I'm thankful for that today. We have a covenant keeping God. We have a God God that is a creating God and he is a life sustaining God. He also uses the term Lord of hosts. You see that? The Lord of hosts. That word hosts uh, is talking about an army, a group of people. And so here's what he's saying. <coughs> Excuse me. What he's saying to you today is that the same God, the Lord of hosts, the Lord who commands the armies of heaven, the, the, the God uh, that, that can take out any enemy, that strong hand God can break any bow. We see it in verse number 9. Break any bow, break any chariot, break any spear. That same God is fighting for you. My friend, listen, when the enemies in the Old Testament would come up against God's people and miraculous things would happen, like at the Red Sea, whenever Pharaoh and his mighty army was going to take out uh, the, the Hebrew people. And listen, the Bible says God parted the water. God's people walked across on dry ground. And then whenever the enemy came and pursued after them, he closed up the water on them and drowned everyone, killing the entire Pharaoh's army. My friend, listen, I'm serving a God today who is able to take care of you, who's able to destroy any enemy, who's able to destroy any chariot, any Pharaoh, any king, any government, any enemy, any demon of hell that comes up against his people. I'm thankful that we serve the Lord of hosts, who is commander of all the armies of heaven, and there's none that will defeat him. And as we've been studying the book of Revelation, chapter number 19, there'll come a day where Jesus Christ comes back and every eye is going to behold him, and he's going to come back with power, and he's going to set every wrong right, and he's going to rule, the Bible says, rule this world with a rod of iron. He's going to set things straight. 
Boy, I'm thankful I'm on the winning side. Amen. <clears throat> the person of refuge. He mentions the word Lord. All capitals in our King James Bible. All capitals, L-O-R-D. That is the word Jehovah God. The word Jehovah means that he is self-existent, eternal God. It means that he exists with the help of none other. My friend, you don't exist with the help of none other. You need air, so you need help from air to breathe, don't you? You can't exist without blood. You, you've got to need the help of blood. You can't exist without food. You need, to, you need help for food. So what I'm saying is you're not self-existent. If, if God cuts off the rain and God cuts off the sunshine, there's no plants. You starve to death. If God doesn't come by your bed and wake you up in the morning, you die. You say, well, no, I don't, I don't believe that. Well, just wait. There, there's a whole lot of people in the cemeteries that would disagree with you today. Because, listen, friend, you can live and you can live your life the way you want to right now, but there will come a day where all of us will die. Because we're not self-existent. We don't just determine, well, I'm just going to live forever. I don't care how much money you have. I don't care how many IRAs and stock accounts you have. I don't care how your health is right now. You could be absolutely healthy. I can't tell you the number of people that I have personally known that were a picture of health and they dropped over dead of a heart attack or they dropped over dead of a brain aneurysm or something happened and boom, automatically they died. A tragedy, a car accident, a fire, anything like that happens and automatically they're gone. You and me are not self-existent, but we serve a God who, listen, even when they took his life, he had power to get back up out of that grave. Listen, my friend, and he lives forevermore. He lives. I'm thankful that we serve a self-existent eternal God. That is the God. Look at this. He's painting a picture for you. The God that will give you refuge and sanctuary. The God who will make your enemies inaccessible to you is the God who makes promises and keeps them. The God, the God who created and gives life. The God who sustains life. The God who is the commander in chief of the armies of heaven. The God who is self-existent. My friend, listen, this refuge is a place of power. This refuge has a person. He says, God is our refuge. God is. Not God does. Not God made. God is. It's, it's not a refuge that God built. It's God. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's not a place that God said you can go to. It's God. It's himself. In him. In him we have victory. In Christ we have salvation. In Christ we have victory. In Christ. Not around him. Not by him. It's not around religion that you'll have peace. My friend, you can know every verse in the Bible and die in your sins and go to hell. Listen, hell will be full of people who, who never told a lie. Hell will be full of people who always did good works. Hell will be full of people who went to church every single Sunday. But they were religious, friend. They had it in their brain, but they never had a relationship in their heart. My friend, listen, going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than sitting in a garage will make you a car. My friend, you cannot be saved by religion. Religion don't protect you. Good works don't protect you. Giving money to the church don't protect you. Praying don't protect you. God is your protector. God is your Savior through the Lord Jesus Christ. And a relationship with Him and in Him is where you'll find that refuge. My friend, I, I, I'm, I'm saddened by the number of people that I know that believe they're okay. I'm okay, preacher. I believe there's a God. I'm okay. I'm not robbing any banks and killing anybody. I'll, I'll give some money to the church. There's people that are unsaved. There's people that aren't even in church that send us money here at this church. I'm thankful for it. I'm thankful for it. And I'll even pray for those people. But my friend, I can't save you. That, that donation can't save you. My friend, you need a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what will save you. That relationship is that place where you can run. Because he's your God. Listen, which brings me to my next point about this refuge. It is a personal refuge. Look at what the Bible says in verse number one. For God is our refuge. Not a refuge or the refuge. He's our refuge. He, he's mine. So this refuge is mine personally. 
by having a relationship with God through the Lord Jesus Christ, which is what God said, whenever Jesus was being baptized, he, he said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, hear ye him. So he said, whatever, whatever Jesus says, that's what I want you to do. Jesus says that there's no way to get to heaven except through him. That's what he says. If we don't repent, we die in our sins. That's what Jesus said. If we call upon the name of the Lord, we shall be saved. That's what Jesus said. And so that same God that is this refuge, he invites us personally, one by one, to have a relationship with him. And just as I have a relationship with God through the Lord Jesus Christ, and I have a place of refuge that I can get in and be safe, you too, my friend, have your relationship with him and your place of refuge. It's not many gods, it's one God, but he's so big, he can be a refuge, a personal refuge to each and every one of us. What a great God. A personal refuge. He's my God. He's my Savior. He's my King. He's my High Priest. He was my sacrifice on the cross of Calvary. He's my protection. He's my refuge tonight. He's my refuge. Uh, the Bible says in verse number one, look at what it says, a very present help in trouble. He's present. He's present. Remember in school when the teacher said, roll call? All right, when I say your name, say present. Present. <laughs> Jason Myers, present. You know, whatever. You're present. You're there. Here's what God's saying. God says, I'm there. God says, I'm there. Hey, listen. You know what God wants you to know today? He says, I'm there. He says, I'm present. He says, oh, you may not see me. It may not seem like it, but I'm present. I'm right there. Look at verse number five. Verse number five says, God is in the midst of her. That is his church. That is his people. I'm in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her, and that right early. God will come right when he needs to come. He says, I'm in the midst of you. I'm there. I'm there. Look at verse number 7. The Lord of hosts is with us. He's with us. Here's what he's saying. I'm there. I'm a very present help. I'm there with you personally. I want you to know that, he says. Listen, it's about time that you have a personal relationship with with the Lord Jesus Christ. Not, not oh, well, my, my son saved, my daughter saved, my family. Oh, my family are good people. My, my family, oh, yeah, they're saved. They're raising their kids right. What about you, friend? Do you personally have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ? I, listen, I'm not asking you when did you get baptized. I'm not asking you when you joined a church. I'm not asking you when you prayed. I'm not asking you if you did good deeds and went through confirmation classes or when your last confession was, how many rosaries you did, how many times you've lit candles, how many priests have prayed for you and your family, how many times you've been baptized or sprinkled or christened or anything like that. My friend, Jesus Christ is the only one who died on the cross for your sins, rose again, and the Bible says, ascended into the heaven, that he sits at the right hand of the throne of God to make intercession for you. Baptism, a preacher, the Pope, rosary beads, none of that, listen carefully, none of that died, was buried, and resurrected, and is sitting at the right hand of God to make intercession for you. There's only one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. There's only one who can bring you to God, and that is Jesus Christ. See, he's either your Savior or he's not. It's that simple. You, you have either acknowledged your sins and called upon the name of the Lord and said, Lord, I'm a sinner, please save me, or you haven't. If you have, then don't be shy about it. Tell somebody about it. That's why we have baptism. Baptism is an outward display of an inward transaction that took place. You got saved. You trusted Christ as your Savior. What you're saying is the old man died. The new man's alive in Christ. So when you get baptized, it's a visible show, a display to everyone. You're making a public statement. I'm with the Lord Jesus Christ. You go under the water. The dead man's buried in that grave. You come up out of that watery grave a new man in Christ. Baptism doesn't save you. Baptism has nothing to do with your salvation. It is simply a symbol, an ordinance of the church that God gave to show visibly what happened invisibly inside your faith. And so that you can publicly make a stand and say, I'm with Jesus. 
That's why they used to do it all down by the riverside. Do it right there in a public area where they would say, yep, yep, I'm a follower of Christ. That's what it is. And my friend, have you followed the Lord Jesus Christ? There is a place of refuge. Now I'm going to give you two quick things here. Two quick things before we end this. Number one, the refuge. Number two, the relief that comes. The relief. The Bible says in verse number two that there's no fear. The Bible says that when we have this refuge, when we have a relationship with God, when we're reading our Bible, praying, when we're having that relationship with Him, there's a place of no fear. No fear. That's what it says in verse number two. Therefore, because of God, we're not going to fear. I have confidence in Him. Number, uh, uh, verse number three. Look at verse number three. There's calm. Calm. You say, where's calm? Well, the waters are roaring. So the opposite of waters roaring is what? Calm water. Still water. That's where the shepherd in Psalm 23 leads us beside the still water. The Bible says there's calm. Verse number three, there's steadfastness or stability. You say, where's that? Well, the mountains are shaking, earthquaking. The opposite of that is stability or steadfastness. So the Bible says we have no fear. We have a calm. We have stability. Verse number four, look at what it says. The Bible says these rivers that come from God, not the troubled waters of the world, the rivers that come from God shall make us glad. There's gladness now. Verse number nine says that there's peace from war and the enemies. Verse number 10, look at what it says. Verse number 10, God said, I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. You know what that means? That's ultimate justice will prevail. You know what that means? God will have the last say. That's what that means. It means that God is just, and even though right now it seems like it's not right, and there might be things in your life that you say, preacher, it's just not right. You just wait. God will make it right. God will make it right. Either here or later, he'll make it right. That's his promise. And so the relief that comes to me in my place of refuge is that I can have no fear. I can have calm and tranquility and peace because I know God's going to take care of my enemy and he's going to make everything right. That's the relief. And then let me give you last the responsibility. What's my responsibility? You say, how do I get this? What am I supposed to do? Now that I know all this, how do I get it? What, what, where does it come? Well, look at what it says in verse number 8. Look at what it says in verse number 8. Come, behold the works of the Lord, what desolations he hath made in the earth. The first responsibility that I have is to come. I have a responsibility to accept the invitation that God gives to me. He says, come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden and I'll give you rest. In the end of the book, in the revelations, the Bible says the spirit of the bride say come. God, Jesus Christ says come. Come to me, the great invitation. He says, I want to have a relationship with you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He says, come to me and I'll give you everlasting life. Accept that. You come. That's your responsibility. The second thing, look at verse number 10. Be still. Be still. What does this mean? It means do nothing and let God be God. Do nothing and let God do what God does. I remember sitting in church, my, my grandmother, uh, my grandmother, my grandma Harrington, uh, where the church I grew up at, her husband, my grandfather, uh, and, and her dad, my great-grandfather, Pap Sizemore, they started that church. And I remember sitting with my grandma, and I like sitting with my grandma because I kind of got away with a little bit more than I got away with, with my dad sitting there. But I like sitting with my grandma because she had a big bag of candies, hard candies in her pocketbook. And she put them, listen, she did it the right way. Let me help you Baptist out with candy and church, okay? You don't have the noisiest rapper in the world, okay? A anytime somebody has candy in church, usually they're, you know, just sitting there, you know, fooling around with this candy and it's, you know, making noise. She, she would have it all in a plastic bag, already unwrapped, all ready to go. And all you have to do is just pull it out. I'll, I'll help you there when we get back to church, okay? So I'd sit with Grandma and boy, she'd have all these candies in there. But if I'd get to carrying on or talking to somebody around me, she'd say, be still. Now be still. What was she saying? She was saying, don't move, just listen. That's what she was saying. Just be still. 
Don't move. Just listen. The, the, the man of God is preaching. He's giving you the word of God. Just be still and listen. And you know what my responsibility is sometimes? My responsibility is to put my faith in God and wait on him. Be still. Stop trying to figure it all out. You know what we try to do when we try to figure out the situation on our own? Sometimes we dig the hole even worse. And God says, just be still. Let me do what I do. Hey, be still in your religion. Don't try to work your way to heaven. Be still. Let God do what he does. He already sacrificed his son on the cross of Calvary. The, the payment of your sins is already made. You don't have to do anything but accept what he did. Be still in your religion. Be still in your good works. Be still in your religious routine that you're doing every day and every week. My friend, listen, just be still and let Jesus be the Savior. Be still, don't worry. Be still, don't fret. Be still, don't let the anxiety take you. My responsibility is to come. My responsibility is to be still. And then he gives another in verse number 10. Know that I'm God. Just know that I'm God. That means that we put our, our faith and our confidence in him. I know that he's God. I know that he's the place of refuge. I know that he is the God of, of Jacob. I know that he is the, the Lord of hosts. I know that he is Elohim, the creator. I know that he is Jehovah, the self-existent God. I'm going to put my faith in him. I'm just going to know that he's God. You know, I'm reminded of a verse that Jesus said when Jesus came to this earth, they didn't accept him. He says in, uh, in Matthew 23, verse 37, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which were sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together even as a hen gathered her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. You know what, you know what Jesus said to these people? that were getting ready to kill him, put him on the cross. He said, Jerusalem, oh, how I would love to gather you like that mama hen before a storm's coming, gathers that brood of little chickens, gets them in under the wings and keeps them safe. Oh, how I'd love to gather you into that place of refuge. But he says, you would not. You won't accept it. You won't let me do what I do. The refuge is there. We don't have to build it. It's there. You don't have to invent it. It's there. All we have to do is run to it. Run to Him. Run to the Lord Jesus Christ. My friend, would you call upon the Lord today? If you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, would you call upon Him and be saved? Would you run to that refuge of salvation? That place, listen, we're all born into sin. and We're going to have to pay for that sin in a place called hell. But Jesus died on the cross, took the wrath of God for our sin, took it upon himself, paid for that sin. And now if we trust him as our Savior, that is that we put our confidence for heaven in him, not in good works and, and church and, and a preacher or pope or, or priest or rosary beads or going to church, singing hymns or whatever. We put our faith in him. Would you do that today? If, if you're a Christian, you say, preacher, I know I'm saved. If you're saved, would you just right now say, Lord, I need your help. God, I'm going to come to you, that place of refuge, and I'm in the middle of a storm right now, and I just can't run away. I, I got to be here. I got to live life. I got to do what I got to do. So, God, would you help me in this place? Run into that refuge. I love the, the scripture that says, the name of the Lord is a high tower, and they that run into it are safe. We go into the name of Christ. We go into his person, and we're safe. We're safe. What a fortress is our mighty God. What a refuge is our God. Would you come to him today? Father, we love you. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you for a place of refuge. Father, help us to remember that you are that refuge. You are that powerful place, that personable God. Lord, I'm thankful that you call upon us to join you. Lord, I'm asking for strength for those that would be listening. I pray that their confidence would be in you. I pray that our hopes would always be in you. Father, we love you. We ask for your help. Help us to be good citizens. Help us to be good Americans. Help us to do what we're supposed to do here in our country, in our home, in our community. Give us the strength. Give us the wisdom. Give us that place of refuge. Protect us from the enemy, Father. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. I thank you, friend, for tuning in. 
uh, tonight. Please share these uh, messages either from our Facebook page or the, uh, or the YouTube. You can share those out there and get the word of the Lord out there. Be praying for one another. Be praying for your church. And let's all come out on Sunday, okay? Listen, I know that we're not in the building, but it's still church time. So listen very carefully. At Victory Baptist Church, you have an opportunity to drive in physically, to drive in church on Sunday morning. You have an opportunity to tune in on Sunday night and Wednesday night, just like we would be at church. Don't put other things in front of God. Because if we do that, listen, That'd be just like church being here and we're not even coming. So, so pay close attention. Keep good habits and good routines in this very strange time. And know that I love you and I'm praying for you. God bless you. Have a great rest of your week.